Lecture 12, Driven Resonance and Quality Factor. In this lecture, we're gonna now consider what happens if we take our mass spring system with damping and we, instead of not applying any other force, we now apply this sinusoidal force to it. So F naught sine omega T say. To derive the solution to this now inhomogeneous differential equation, if you're in math 2Z03, then you can use the method of undetermined coefficients or maybe variation of parameters. I'm gonna show you through the method of undetermined coefficients by assuming a particular solution of this form. This should be valid as long as omega, uh, sine omega t and cos omega t are not in the homogeneous solution, and they're not because the homogeneous ones only had, uh, even if they did have sines and cosines, they were always modulated by exponentials, and so you couldn't get bare sines and cosines like these. Plus, they may not necessarily be the same frequency either. All right, so uh, let's, I like to make a, a table whenever I do method of undetermined coefficients. The xp is a sine omega t plus b cos omega t. That's what the table means. And then xp prime would be negative omega b sine omega t omega a cos omega t. xp double prime is negative omega squared a sine omega t minus omega squared b cos omega t. And then you can add up the different terms when you substitute in xp as follows by adding the things in the rows above and figure out right away how many sine and cosine terms you have. Then we've got our f, so the applied force on the right side would be f naught sine omega t and zero cos omega t. And what we need is that this, the left side of the de, is equal to the right side of the de. So we get two equations, that this is that, and that this is that. All right, solving these two equations, what are the, what are the unknowns in these equations? Well, the unknowns are the, are the A and the B. That's what we picked for our particular solution. So we're solving these for A and B, and we come up with this A, substituting back into the, into the oh, and also the B there. So we found B and then we found A, substituting those into our XP, we've got this, solution. So this is the form of the solution. It's a sum of a sine and cos at the same frequency. And so if we want, we can rewrite that as a single sine or cos with a phase constant. Let's try writing it as a single cosine. And we'll use the sum angle formula for cosine to expand the term on the right. Then equate the left and right sides of this equation to come up with some expressions that we can then rewrite, uh, we can then use to rewrite xp in terms of just a single cos with a phase shift. All right, now if we take this and we decide to rewrite in terms of the natural frequency and the damping ratio, maybe that's something we wanna do too. You can try that on your own if you want to get experience with what this solution is, if you're still with me here, then xp is negative f naught over m divided by this square root term here, cosine of omega t and a phase shift. So the input was a positive sine function. To more explicitly write the phase shift, we may want to rewrite this in terms of a sine by using the fact that uh, negative cos is a sine of x minus pi by 2. So we can take this to be xp is equal to getting rid of the negative this thing, sine omega t plus phi, where now phi is negative the arctan of the difference in these frequencies divided by this damping and frequency dependent term minus pi by two. So in other words, the total solution, if you, uh, if you don't care for math 2z03 material, then jump up to this stuff. Uh, the total solution is this term we had before, the homogeneous solution, which has the arbitrary constants in it, plus this term that depended on the inhomogeneous part, the particular solution to the differential equation, where we've got our, our phi and our omega naught, and as before, zeta b over two root mk is the damping ratio. So because we've got maple in this course, we can check our result with maple. I did it using still m and b and k. I encourage you to try to modify the code to do it in terms of omega naught um, and zeta to really compare with this a little bit more directly. So here's how it looks in maple. The arbitrary constants are underscore C2, underscore C1. There's the exponential terms in the front. Maple opted not to rewrite the transient, uh, this first part here in terms of cosine and sine. But besides that, it's the same. 
Okay, so the solution has two parts. It's got this first part, which we'll call the transient term, and this decays with e to the negative b over 2mt. So this, uh, this first term here decays away in time, but the second term sticks around. It doesn't have this exponential decay factor. This is called the steady state term. So transient term in that after an amount of time, it's going to decay away, so it's temporary, and the permanent or steady state term is the one that's, uh, that comes from the driving force. Limiting cases of driving frequency. So now what we're going to do is consider what happens to the, the system in some extreme value. So we've got this is our amplitude and uh, of, the, of the steady state term, and we know that it has a phase shift up here of phi. So let's just uh, let's go ahead and bring that in. So we've got our phase shift and we've got our amplitude. And, and what we want to know is what is going to be the limit of this in the low frequency or DC response range. So when frequency is really low, then what happens to the amplitude? What happens to the phase? Okay, substituting in that limit, the amplitude transforms into just F0 over K, and the phase shift becomes zero. So in low frequency, the response to this force is just determined by the spring constant and the force and not by the damping or the mass, is independent of frequency, and is perfectly in phase with the excitation. So there's no phase shift between the excitation. Notice that F0 over K is the extension that the F0 force would produce in a spring with spring constant K. So this is just being whatever it would be at DC. If we're at a relatively low frequency, then the, the spring at any point, the harmonic behavior of the spring doesn't matter because it's uh, we've, we're moving slow enough that the, the time dependence goes away, and so the spring just behaves like we're used to seeing springs behave. What is the response of the system when omega is much bigger than omega naught? What about extremely high frequency? Well, now the amplitude limits to F naught over M divided by omega squared. The phase shift turns out to be negative pi. So the response at high frequency is the mass, uh, is mass determined, not determined by the damping or the spring constant, and decays with omega squared, lags 180 degrees behind the input. What about when the frequency is omega naught? So when we actuate it, when we drive the system at its natural resonant frequency. Now we have an amplitude that depends on the DC behavior divided by two zeta. So for low damping, we get a bigger amplitude and the phase shift is negative pi by two. So the response depends only on the, the DC response and the damping and it's pi by two behind the input. Let's summarize that last case a bit. So we found that in steady state, the response to this system, to this force, when we drive with a force at a frequency equal to the natural resonant frequency of the mass spring system, then the, the response is this. So we've got a phase shift of pi by two. It's pi by two lagging behind the driving force. The response also has an amplitude that depends on the damping. So one over two zeta is the root of mk over b from our definition earlier. If the damping is low, so that the inverse of two zeta is, uh, is a fair bit larger than one, driving the system at its natural frequency puts it into resonance. So the harmonic driving force pushes on the mass in perfect synchronization with its movement and builds in the velocity from the cycle before, leading to higher response amplitude than the same force would produce at low frequency. For this reason, the natural frequency of a system is the resonant frequency. Just like when you're pushing somebody on a swing, if you push them at exactly the right rate, you can get the swing to go farther and farther. Pushing at the right rate means pushing at the right frequency. Let's do an example of resonance. Plot the position versus time for a mass spring system with this frequency, this damping, uh, driven with a force corresponding to F0 over K is one, at three different frequencies. So suppose we've got a driving force of two, 10, and 50, and plot these all together. Let's use maple to solve it. First, we need to figure out what F0 over M is really, not F0 over K. So if F0 over K is one, then F0 over M must be one times omega naught squared, or in this case, 100. 
substituting in our numbers and writing the differential equation that you may have come up when I uh, come up with when I gave you a chance to try it in terms of omega naught and zeta earlier, we can substitute in our initial condition. I guess I didn't really give you the initial values, so let's uh, let's just say that it started off at at zero, and then uh, see what the result is. So. Plotting these, we've got the low frequency response, we've got the resonant frequency response, the big green one there, and we've got a high frequency response, which is the yellow. So the yellow one is the uh, the very highest frequency response, and this is a lot. This is shunted. So you see, as expected, it's a much lower amplitude than the than the resonant frequency. The low frequency response is basically just a sine wave. At the at an amplitude of one, All right? So that's exactly what we were expecting from our DC amplitude there, the F naught over K. And we've got uh, let's let's look at the size of the resonance here. It looks like the resonance is modified by that. So instead of one, it's an amplitude close to eight. Is that what we would have expected? Omega uh, zeta is one over sixteen. So going back up here to what we expected at resonance, F naught over K is one, and the inverse of two zeta would be the inverse of two over 16, inverse of an eighth or eight. Okay, so yeah, we got eight times the low frequency response by just driving it at the right frequency, driving it at resonance. What about amplitude and phase shift log plots? So this next exercise has you go back to the amplitude and phase shift formula we had earlier. Just to remind you what those were. Amplitude and phase shift formulas were here. So this one before we sub in the resonance thing and this part before we substitute in the particular frequency there. So take those formulas and for Omega naught is 10, zeta is a 16th, and F naught over K is one again. Plot the log of amplitude versus log frequency, and then plot the phase versus the log of frequency. Not the log of the phase, just the phase. Okay. Here's the code to do that. And here's the, here's the results. So the log of amplitude versus log frequency, and the phase versus frequency. Together, these two things are called Bode plots. So this is uh, collectively a Bode plot for the response of this mass spring system. That terminology is used more in circuits when we have resonant circuits there. You may see that if you continue on with 3BA3 next year. So what we got is the response amplitude starting off at one and then rising up to what should be eight at resonance, then dropping off with increasing frequency as we go higher and higher. The phase starts off with no phase shift at low frequency, 90 degree behind the input at resonance, and then 180 degrees behind the input at high frequencies. The final thing we're gonna talk about here is the quality factor. This is a, another term that's used like the damping ratio when people talk about resonances. The amplitude amplification from DC is the quality factor. So up here, we found that when we were at resonance, we had an amplitude that was eight times higher than the DC amplitude, and so we'd have a quality factor of eight. The quality factor characterizes how sharp the resonant peak is. Higher quality factor would mean a higher peak, uh, and a lower quality factor would be a, a narrower, uh, a shallower peak, less, less pointy. There's some other definitions that we're concerned with. So in addition to this, which turns out to be one over two zeta, you can define the quality factor as two pi times the peak energy stored to the energy dissipated per cycle at resonance. Let's see if that works. Energy stored, you can uh, use the kinetic or the potential energy. Here's an example of a proof using the potential energy substituting in in terms of our displacement at resonance using the resonant amplitude and the dissipated ener energy per cycle to find that second part of it, the energy dissipated per cycle. We'll, ne we'll need to know the the rate of energy dissipation. That goes into the, that's the work done on the damping force. Work done on the damping force is the force of kind of us on the the fluid which would be integral of negative force of damping with respect to position. So this is calculating the work over the full cycle. Uh, 
and the work done on the damping force. So the, the damping force was negative B dx by dt, so negative BV, right? And so the negatives will cancel with this negative that was in front and then that one from the damping force being in the opposite direction of the velocity. We can replace dx with velocity times dt and come up with the integral of the velocity squared with respect to time. Using the steady state response only, we know that the velocity squared is given by this function. And since the average of a cos squared is a half, we can find the energy dissipated per cycle as this term, half of the period, writing the maximum energy divided by the energy dissipated per cycle and cleaning things up, we come up with, sure enough, the quality factor. Done. Okay, now the next, if, uh, if that one was kind of tough, where do you see the next proof? The quality factor as the ratio of resonant frequency to the half width, full width, full width at half maximum in the power response versus frequency graph. And the power goes like the square of the amplitude. So why does power go like square of amplitude? Consider the peak energy stored. We said that energy is related to the amplitude squared, right? Power is just the energy per time. So the power response graph would be something that's proportional to the square of the amplitude. Okay, what is the half width? It's if you were to plot this, now this is the amplitude spectrum, but if you were to plot the power spectrum and then say, all right, where is it at half of its maximum value? You divide the maximum by two, you go down to that height, and then you say, how wide is it? The width is a, is a value of, is a range of frequencies because this is the frequency spectrum. Okay. So, returning to the frequency dependent steady state response, we need to know how the amplitude depends on the frequency now, rather than just use the one at resonance. And the ampli amplitude amplification compared to DC, we're going to write this, uh, figure out what the amplitude amplification is. So, how big of an amplitude change do we have at whatever frequency we're at? Relative power response would be the square of this. And to clean this up, we've defined two new convenience variables, the relative frequency relative to the resonant frequency and this Xi term, which is two zeta all squared, just to, uh, to not have to write really complicated things a, a bunch of different times. Okay, so using the new convenience variables, this cleans up a little bit and we can go about solving for the uh, for the frequency where we've got half of the power. That's what we're looking for here. So the relative frequency at the half width turns out to be given by this. And now we'll make some approximations. If the damping is small, then this Xi term must also be small. So two minus Xi is basically just two. And this xi squared plus 4xi, the xi squared drops off compared to the 4xi, so we'll just take that as 4xi. And the omega relative squared turns into this term, which is basically going back to zeta, 1 plus or minus 2 zeta. Okay, so our change in frequency is omega naught times the, uh, the relative difference in frequencies, getting this. And now whenever we've got a difference of roots like this, where some, where there's the, the roots that you're subtracting from each other are almost the same number, it's a good idea to use the binomial series to clean that up a bit so that you can have some things cancel. Doing this and keeping just the first term, uh, first non-constant term in the binomial series, we see some things cancel and we find that the half width should be equal to omega naught to zeta. So sure enough, omega naught divided by the half width is the quality factor. This definition, unlike the previous two definitions, relied on the fact that the damping was small. So the third definition is only really equal to the first two definitions of quality factor when you have small damping. Small, how small? So that you can make the approximations that we made here. So we, what did we approximate? We approximated that two minus xi is approximately two. We approximated that xi squared is negligible compared to four xi.
where again, xi is the square of two zeta. And we approximated that we can drop the order x squared terms for an x of two zeta. So we approximated that zeta squared is negligible compared to zeta. Two more exercises here. Exercise, total response in terms of quality factor. Rewrite the total response of the system. This is the x as a function of time, including the transient and the steady state in terms of quality factor and natural frequency. So rather than using the damping ratio, try to use the quality factor and see what it looks like. Okay. Here's our previous one in terms of damping ratio. And now, since Q is one over two zeta, we can just substitute that all in in terms of the quality factor and come up with expressions like this. Transient decay time. In terms of Q, how many cycles, given from the uh, building on the last question, does it take for the transient response to drop to one over E of its initial value? Well, the transient response has the exponential decay term e to the negative omega naught over 2qt, which is one, uh, which gives you a negative one in the exponent when t is q times the period divided by time.